We're here at Trek, which is the Tropical Research and Education Center here in Homestead, Florida. And what they do here is a lot of research on tropical fruit, on vegetables, and on ornamental plants. Uh, they have all sorts of interesting experiments going on. It's really important stuff that they do. So you see how yellow, some of them are light green and then dark green. And so we're testing five rootstocks uh, and four different scions. One of them is the traditional line that mm -hmm. you're familiar with, and then three others. Um, and so the idea was we planted this, and the idea is that they're all going to get infected with greening. <laughs> sure enough, guess what? They've got greening, and so now the test really starts. So what can tolerate that bacterial disease and still be productive? And have tasty fruit. And have tasty fruit, yeah. So, so far, uh, really the best scion is the tradi traditional Tahiti lime so <laughs> far. Uh, we'll see about the others. But the rootstocks can have a profound effect, and the idea is that four of these rootstocks supposedly provide tolerance to citrus green. Mm -hmm. And then one is the traditional rootstock. So we will see, now that everything has greening, this is year three, we will see, and you'll see stem dieback in some of them, so you're, we're already seeing differences. And of course down here we have another issue which is the high pH soil, very calcareous soil and iron deficiency is a huge problem. Yeah. So there's two things going on, but anyway, so we're looking forward to having this continue a number of years so we can get a feel for it. Because the idea is that Tahiti lime actually has some mild tolerance to citrus greening, mm -hmm. just inherent. And so if we can put a combination with a tolerant rootstock, we would hope to see more plantings. Right now there's about 60 acres have been replanted of Tahiti lime. And you know, we, prior to Andrew, we had 6,000 acres. I had one tree. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> and then after Andrew, we had about 3,000. Well, we had 2,000 acres, and then we built back up to about 3,500. And then with citrus canker came in, the industry was removed. Mm -hmm. And so we've been at zero. And so now we're about 60 acres. But we really need to find, uh, if we find a good rootstock combination, we would, we'd see more acreage come back. So have you done any uh, experiments with nutrition? Because I thought that was the, the big... Yeah. Um, yeah. The big uh, mover in, uh, for know. citrus green. Yeah. yeah. So what we're doing is we're we're implementing a nutrition program that was suggested that's a high nutrition program. Yet you see what's going on. We also this used to be an avocado planting, and we had a really good windbreak. That was taken out by Laura Wilt. Yeah. And the citrus canker in here has now increased dramatically because windbreaks are used to reduce the amount of, of citrus canker, and the citrus canker causes leaf drop and things like that. So anyway, we're learning a lot of things. So is that because of the um, the wind uh, wind driven yeah, rain? It, oh, the wind driven rain. I was thinking that maybe the the leaves were getting little cracks in them from the wind, and then having them actually from from very small particles blown blowing by in the wind. blown by the wind, which causes a micro crack, and yeah. then the and then the bacteria gets in. Right. Yeah, so it's it's an interesting. And before, before, when this windbreak was here, we had no problems really with citrus gang. Since the windbreak has gone, these are long gang trees, yeah. so you know they've grown pretty quickly, but they're not not quick enough. Not quick enough. So, but you still have some avocados. Yeah, over here, these are a neighbor. Uh, these are ours, and these small trees are actually um, varieties on rootstocks and scions from California. So, Haas. Jam, uh, Lamb Haas, and then some of their Duke 7 is a rootstock, Dusa is another rootstock. And the big trees were part of a, these are seedling trees, is part of a rootstock study previously to look for rootstocks that were resistant to Phytophthora root rot, which is a fungus problem on avocados. Uh, so, it, I mean, it looks like you have some success then. There would yeah. Although they need to, it needs to be taken to the next step. So these need to be used to propagate new trees and then challenged. And these were challenged previously, but only as seedlings. Mm -hmm. So we really needed to, to take it to the next step. Um, 
So that's sort of what's going on. We got these small trees from California. This is our guava planting, um, which we've been using for fruit fly work and also uh, what we call minor use uh, pesticide registration program. This is indigo. One of our researchers, Dr. Vendrami, is looking at the potential for indigo in Florida. Mm. So that's what this planting is about. Now this one might be one you want to you want to film or talk about or something. But these, so this is a predominantly kit mango block, and it looks weedy, right? And that's on purpose. We had a graduate student who graduated last year with Dr. Carillo, Dr. Daniel Carillo, who's our entomologist on fruit crops. And he was looking at what insects pollinate mangoes. And, you know, I mean, in the literature, it talks about flying insects. Well, there's only about 10 million species of flying insects, but which one? And there's been anecdotal evidence that it's not honeybees. And sure enough, uh, the results from his study, it's mostly um, solitary flies. And I don't mean just a house fly, but many other species of flies. And so, you know, we've suspected that for a long time, but he has really verified that it's honeybees. Out of the three groves that they It's not the honeybees, not, but the flies. Yeah. It's the flies, yeah. So uh, then the so, flies are attracted to the weeds? Yeah, so what the, yeah, so there had been some study done somewhere else with mangoes as well and what they found was that if you allow the weeds or wildflowers to grow you build up the population of these alternative pollinators so that when the trees bloom you have this large population they found that if you had a combination of the alternative pollinators plus in their case, they were using honeybees. Um, they got much better fruit set than if they had either one alone. So the idea with this is just to let the weeds, so we harvested the fruit in July, and then since then we've been letting the weeds grow. Weeds is a funny term. Those little white flowers, those are Bidens. That's a native flowering weed, <laughs> people call it. Um, but the idea is that these alternative pollinators need habitat to build up their population. So what we'll do is we're, we're just gonna leave this and then the plants are gonna flower. We're gonna leave it while it's flowering. Once the flowering is over, then we'll come in and, and mow it. Uh, because then it gets to be a disease issue, right? So if you have, you know, if the weeds are too high and there's too much moisture, then you end up with, you know, fungus problems and things like that. So, right, yeah. so it's sort of a timing issue. So there's really no reason to be mowing this. The other advantage of letting the weeds grow is that you know you want your trees to be dormant and mangoes need to be dormant anywhere depending on the variety from three weeks to three four five months and so by by the weeds competing and drying out the soil you know that drought stress tends to stop trees from growing as does cool weather so it could be an enhancement for getting the trees not to begin sending out new shoots now because if they really start sending out shoots now they're not gonna that's they won't be flowers they'll be new leaves so we want them to stay dormant and by having the weeds compete for the water and any residual nutrients uh, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of cool weather maybe we'll get below <laughs> <laughs> We're 50. Oh, yeah, crazy. 50. <laughs> crazy you know, talk. And, you know, have to put on our parkas and things like that. So, so I've heard of um, like people letting weeds grow and then mowing them as the the trees flower. So to that force they, them up. Yeah, and so it's it's interesting to have like continuing habitat. For, I mean, it's two different strategies yeah. that accomplish the same yeah. thing pretty much. So that's a very good point. And it may be for some of the species that you need to force them up into the trees by removing their habitat. That may, and then for others, it may not be a good idea to remove the habitat. So I just, that I do not know, yeah. do not know. So yeah, that's a good thought. I'm gonna leave it this year and we'll see how that looks. Um, we would love to do much more work on pollination and tropical fruits. That's one of the things with Daniel, Dr. Kudu, I'd love to do because we don't know really solidly what pollinates some of these crops like mame, sapodilla, um, canistel. Um, we really don't know what's pollinating those. And, and it doesn't look like honeybees. 
so it, it's an interesting thing. We, it, the more we know, you know, because people, uh, I'll give you an example, in, Ma in uh, Matt May, you'll see thrips. Mm -hmm. And some people say, oh no, we got a spray. Yeah, There's thrips. Be well, actually, <laughs> you could be killing your pollinator. You might want to be careful about that. So we need to, there's so much opportunity to learn more uh, about that. Um, the more you know, the more you don't, you know, the you don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, isn't that true? Yeah, really. Anyway, so it looks a little untidy. The, the, um, some of the, the, the director was like, yeah, can't we? We had our, our, our we had our 90th anniversary, and he's like, "Can't we mow that?" And I'm like, yeah. "No, you can't mow it. It's gotta stay." Yeah, I've definitely seen um, those those larger blue flies pollinating. Uh, and that's that's one of them. Yeah, for sure. Yes, yes. And then I have a friend in uh, Orlando. He's noticed the same thing on his mango tree up in Orlando. So, uh, not that there are that many mango trees up there, right. but they have the flies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. This is a cover crop study. We have an agroecologist here at the station now, and he's looking at the effect of environmental, surrounding environment on cover crop growth and production and usefulness. So he's got this same planting in three different places in Trek. You'll see the other places. Some of them, one of them is next to a natural area, one is out in the open, one is here and surrounded by different tree crops. And so he's, he's trying to see if there's any effect of the local microclimate. So most of what you study here are tree, tropical trees, right? No, Fruit trees? no. no. We, we have a group of scientists that work on vegetables, oh, okay. a group that works on ornamentals, a group that works on fruit crops. So we have an entomologist and a plant pathologist for each of those groups. Mm -hmm. Plus we have uh, an agroecologist now that's looking at hemp and other agronomic crops like cover crops. And then um, we also have about a fourth, a quarter of the faculty that works on natural resources. So Everglades restoration, coastal ecology, things like that. So there's really you know, four different groups. But there's a lot of interaction uh, among the groups. This is an old avocado planting. You see some missing trees, things like that. Um, we're going to be using this in some new work on Laurel Wilk. Uh, so these trees may not be here next year. <laughs> because we're going we're gonna to end up killing them, probably. <laughs> but that's why they're here, right? You know, it's better than... <laughs> The growers feel. So here's some of the tomato research that the plant pathologist is looking at. He's using uh, some things he's calling very, it sounds funny, but it, very small molecules to control some bacterial uh, diseases. Um, as far as I know, most molecules are pretty small. I haven't heard of any real big molecules, but <laughs> ones that I can see with my eyes, but I'm just kidding, but uh, that's what he's looking at there. These are more guavas. This is Barbie Pink. You, you might have right, yeah, heard of Barbie. It's supposed to be pest resistant. Yeah. I'm not, I, I, you know, not I'm quite not totally comment. on board there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, we're getting ready to put in more passion fruit. That's what the holes are. And the tie We're going to put in more dragon fruit. And so this is. How are you growing your dragon fruit? Are you using uh, cables or, or posts or what? Well, we have. Uh, Poles and tubing on a planting, I'll show you. It's a real small oh, okay. plant. These are going to be the one on the other side of this planting of Jatropha. That's a biodiesel fuel crop. Mm -hmm. That's Those aren't dead plants. Those They haven't leafed out. Yeah, they, they lose their leaves in the winter. But the pataya will be on poles. We're going to go to a pole system. Great. Um, these are long gans, so we have a small, we have four different varieties of long gans for some of the work we've been doing. Lychees as well. We've been working on that lychee. Yeah. Mite. Yeah. <laughs> so on the right hand side are all seedlings. Papayas on the right there. On the left hand side is a comparison of two varieties. The ones with the purple stems is a genetically modified papaya. So TR honey or it's no, it's one we produced. Oh, okay. And so you know the major disease of papayas is the papaya ring spot virus, right? Mm -hmm. So usually what happens is you grow papayas, even the tolerant ones like Red Lady or Tainung number three, number five or number one. And the plant does okay for the first year, 18 months, maybe two years if you're lucky. And then the virus gets the upper hand and you pretty much need to replace the planting. And it's you know it costs money to replant papaya, so you're looking at you know six eight thousand dollars an acre if you're putting it on plastic and drip. So we, long story short, 
about 10 years ago, we decided to start a breeding program, which has started with funding from the Tropical Fruit Growers, uh, Tropical Fruit Advisory Council. And so it was to create papayas that were resistant to the virus. So we did some genetic modification and came up with um, papaya accessions or lines that are resistant to the virus. So I've had papayas in the field, not this planting, but other planting, um, seven, eight years, no virus. So that's the idea. So what we're doing now is we're, we're getting ready to take enough data and get enough information to start uh, offering them. Hopefully we're going to get them patented and then offering them to the industry if they want to grow them. And I know GM can be um, controversial, but it's basically the way we did it and the way this one works, it's like a vaccination. So we took a little piece of the protein coat off of the virus. The, you know, most viruses are covered, have a protein coat. So we took the protein coat off, inserted it into the DNA of the papaya, and then grew the papayas out, made crosses with other varieties, and then that's what you see here. So what happens is now when the aphid transmits the virus to these plants, it can't replicate the virus. And so the plant doesn't get the disease, basically. So all of these have a non-transmittable virus in them as part of their incorporated into them? Well, actually what happens is they have the coat protein in them. And, and so what happens when the virus with the coat protein gets into the plant, right, by an aphid feeding on the plant, the plant in the cellular system won't let that virus replicate. It, it starts to replicate and then it gets stopped. It's like, you know, you, you're, you're typing something and then all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of T's where you, and then all of a sudden it starts typing again. And so it, it goes and then, uh-oh, I can't go any further. So it doesn't replicate the virus. So that's the idea with it. Um, so we'll see what happens. So hopefully the fruit tastes good too. Yeah, yeah. So because <laughs> it'd be hard to sell the plant. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, that's but the fruit is even more. Yeah, exactly. So we have we have four basic lines. Um, this purple stem we call the T line, um, but we have other ones as well. So hopefully we're going to be moving ahead with some grower testing in the near future. Um, let's see if I'll show you some other stuff. Hey, Sarah. Um, so this is sort of the initial breeding program, but we also had more papayas out there in the field, and this is, this is sort of out here to the left, is the second generation of plant breeding. So what we're doing, the varieties that we're developing are mostly the, the Maridol or Formosa type, the long, elongated type. Dr. Chambers, this is a collection of different papaya varieties, part of it. But the new plants, he's incorporating the resistance that we have for the virus into the solo types. And so hopefully next three, four years, we'll be able to offer solo type papayas that are also resistant to the virus. And I think that would be a, a big boon uh, for development of a redevelopment, let me put it that way, redevelopment of the papaya industry down there in South Florida. So we'll see how that goes, but that's what that's what's going on there. That's a collection plus some valuation plots. We've been there, there's mites that attack papayas, the, the leaves, mm -hmm. and we've been controlling that with a biological control botanigar. Um, and in the past, we've used Swarovski mites, which is a predatory mite that feeds on the pest mite. Is that from the famous Swarovski crystal family? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just oh, okay. <laughs> that I don't know. Um, I just met somebody who worked for Swartzke's oh, Crystal, and so oh, it's like that's a bit like, oh, and they have a mite division oh, also. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, this is um, one of our sugar apple plantings, and um, we've been doing a lot of work on pollination of sugar apples, and both natural and artificial. And, um, you know, there's no really sugar apples on there anymore, but that's why we've been using this. So this. We're, I would love to get more students to try to finish up the understanding and improving the natural pollination system. You know, it's pollinated by beetles, right? And so if we could enhance um, the beetle natural pollination by, there are attractants for the beetles now. What we don't know is if, you, if I put the attractant in the trees, do the beetles just go to the attractant and forget about the flowers? Or do they go to the flowers? So, 
you know, that's something that needs to be worked out, but theoretically it could work. And if we could enhance the pollination, of course, more fruit set, more production, you know, on and on. It'd be interesting to, to put the attractant down and then once you see the flowers, take it away. Well, that would be, yeah. that. And, and also, you know, it does dissipate. So maybe you could time it that it's just gonna work for like a week, uh -huh. you know what I mean, yeah. during the flowering, and then it's dissipated, and now the the, the beetles, uh, if it's flowering, would be attracted to the flowers. So yeah, exactly. 